أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد راودوه عن ضيفه فطمسنا أعينهم فذوقوا عذابي ونذر صلوا على محمد وآل محمد One of the strongest desires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equipped us with is the desire for physical satisfaction, the desire of intimacy, the sexual desire. And this desire Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equipped the human being with just like all the other desires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the human. Just like the desire to eat, to sleep, to rest, to have a family, there is also a physical desire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the human being and equipped the human being when creating the human. And this desire, it has to be dealt with just like all the other desires are dealt with. For example, if you're hungry, what type of food are you going to eat? Are you going to just go eat any food out there? Are you going to eat dirty food? Are you going to go and drink poison? Are you going to eat something that is poisonous for you? No. Any sane person, they go and they make sure that they watch what they eat and how they eat the type of food that they ate and where they got it from. The same goes with all other desires, including the physical desire. When it comes to satisfying and dealing with that physical desire, how am I supposed to deal with that desire? Do I just go anywhere, wherever I can find the fastest way to deal with that desire and immediately deal with it? Or is there a special way? Or is there a specific way that I am ordered to deal with that desire and satisfy that desire? When we look at the religion of Islam, we see that it is not just a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The religion of Islam is not just about spirituality. The religion of Islam is a way of life. And a part of that way of life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us how to deal with all of these desires that He equipped us with. Therefore, we cannot transgress. We cannot pass the red lines. When it comes to anything, we cannot pass the red lines in order to satisfy our desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the physical desire in numerous verses in the Qur'an. One part Allah says, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ وَخَالَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتِ الْأَخْ وَبَنَاتِ الْأُخْتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us who is haram, what type of relationship is forbidden, and what type of relationship is okay. Now someone might read this verse and they might say, okay, this is the obvious. Why does Allah and the holiest book that was sent down by the Prophet need to tell me that حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ Your mother is haram upon you. This is common sense. This is logic. Anyone would understand this. The answer is that no, it's not logical. It's logical when you are in the state of sanity. But when you're in the state of insanity, it becomes illogical. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the obvious because when that desire, it takes over someone, you see that this person becomes an animal. The person becomes an animal and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the desire when it's at its highest peak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as a sakrah, 
a state of intoxication. Maybe someone is not intoxicated through alcohol, through drugs. But when that desire kicks in, when that desire, when someone is seduced, when that desire is at its highest peak, you see that the smartest person, the most successful person, maybe this person is a leader of a company, a CEO, a president of a country, a king, whatever it may be, whatever he may be or she may be, you see that when that desire takes over, this person is completely intoxicated. And their desires take full control of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a group of people in the Qur'an a group of people whose desires took over them. And because their desires took over them, in a way, the punishment of Allah came upon them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that they were in a state of intoxication. لَعَمْرُكَ إِنَّهُمْ لَفِي سَكْرَتِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi لَعَمْرُكَ إِنَّهُمْ لَفِي سَكْرَتِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ They were intoxicated. They were intoxicated not through alcohol, not through drugs, but they were intoxicated by that desire. When that desire kicks in, there's nothing that stops it. This is why the religion of Islam has ordered the men, the men and the women to practice modesty and practice the hijab so that you don't reach you don't reach that level of intoxication where you will not be able to control yourself anymore. You know, hijab, hijab, it, it, perform, it, it acts as a perimeter around sin. When, when the hijab is being practiced, when modesty is being practiced, that is so that you do not go straight into committing adultery and committing sin and fornication. Just like when you're driving in the highway, and there is a car accident. When there's a car accident, the police, they come two miles before the accident, they come and they start placing cones. They start turning on the lights, merge, get on the left lane, get on the right lane. Why? So that you don't drive into that accident. So that you don't suddenly just see yourself in an accident, in a situation where you're going to harm yourself. The same goes with the physical the physical desire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed rules. The hijab, there's a wisdom behind it. Modesty, there's a wisdom behind it. And that is so that we do not harm ourselves. You come and you look at societies, you look at countries where there is no modesty. You look at countries where there is no practicing hijab, you see that no one feels safe. And this is what the statistics say. This is not what we are saying. There are statistics that say, for example, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, every two minutes, someone is sexually assaulted in the United States. It is estimated that every 1,000 women attending a college or university, there are 35 incidents of rape each academic year. And the study says that the ones that are not in the university, the, ri the risk is higher. We're talking about one of the safest countries in the world. We're talking about a country that doesn't have ISIS roaming around, that doesn't have terrorists roaming around like you see in other places in the world. This is one of the safest countries in the world. But yet, you see that every two minutes someone is sexually assaulted. 33% of women say that they have been touched at one point in their life against their will. This is the safest country in the world and this is happening? Does it make sense? Yes, because modesty is not practiced. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us numerous examples where modesty should be, should be practiced in the Holy Qur'an. And one example is the story of Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet Lut alayhum salam. These were prophets. These were prophets sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes an incident that took place. These angels, 
they come down in the figure of men, in the figure of good-looking men, like many of the young gentlemen that we see here. They came down, but they were angels. They had, they had a mission. They had two objectives. The first was that they were sent to tell Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam that he is going to have a child, Ismail. This was the first thing that they came and they told Prophet Ibrahim. And then they go to his nephew who was living in a village in a city nearby. And his nephew is Prophet Lut alayhi salam. This Prophet of Allah, he was dealing with a group of people that practiced Sin, a wrong sin, the abnormal sin, something that has become very normal in society today. Where the Supreme Court just voted yesterday, they allowed homosexual, homosexual marriage to be legalized all over the United States. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in Surah Al-Hijr, وَجَاءَ أَهْلُ الْمَدِينَةِ يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ these angels, they came. Whenever anyone that would come to their city, anyone that passes by their city, the narrations, the hadith, the taf tafsir says that they were greedy people. So in order to make no one pass by their city, they would go and sexually assault the men that, and the women that come in their city, that are passing by. Until it became a habit until it became a habit where men would sexually assault another man. So these angels, they come and they're passing to, by the city. The people of the city, they became very excited. You have new men that are coming, they're passing by, they became very excited. Prophet Lut alayhi salam, he told them, these are my guests. Do not humiliate me. He would go and he would try to protect these guests. They told him, Oh Lord, we have nothing to do with you. Let us love. Let love prevail. Let love win. Who cares? You know, you go and do your thing and we're doing our thing. And this is exactly what's going on today, my dear brothers and sisters. They come and they tell you, let love win. But in reality, they're in being involved in your life and in your family's life and in your children's life and in every issue of your life. Because in the United States, it, was not, it wasn't illegal to carry out that ridiculous act in private. You go and you do whatever you want in your house. But then now, they're trying to come and impose it upon me and you and I. They're trying to impose it and make it be the norm when it is abnormal. And of course, it's not only the Muslims, it's not only the religious people that are saying that this is an abnormal act. Up until 1973, 1973, before, before 1973, homosexuality was seen as a mental problem. It was seen as a problem that they had to go to psychiatrists and they had to go to doctors to get a cure. So now, suddenly, after 1973, the world figured out what's best for them and what's best for all of society and every citizen of the, of the United States. So, this is what they told Prophet Ibrahim, they, they told Prophet Lut alayhi salam. قَالُوا أَوَلَمْ نُنْهِكَ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ We have nothing to do with you. We want to carry out our act and you go and you do whatever you want. He told them there are women in the city, either my daughters or as he is a father of, he is a spiritual father of everyone in the city. He says there are women in the city. You don't need to do a sin. You don't need to do this, this act. And then Allah says, لَعَمْرُكَ إِنَّهُمْ لَفِي سَكْرَتِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّيْحَةُ مُشْرِقِينَ Allah says, by the life of Rasulullah, they were intoxicated by their desires. When the desire overcomes, that's it. 
a person is intoxicated. This is why the religion of Islam makes sure, this is why the religion of Islam stresses on the issue of marriage, stress, stresses on the issue of family, on the issue of protection and modesty. Yes, we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect our families. At a young age, we have to know who our children are speaking to, where they're hanging out, who their friends are, who their teachers are, and what they're teaching them. Today, the challenges that we Muslims are facing today are very different from the challenges that we were facing 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Today, the challenges are much more difficult. This is why we need to be extra vigilant. We need to be very watchful. Know where our family is, what's going on. Right now, you turn on the TV, any, almost all movies, almost all soap operas, all shows, it has types of indecent behavior being performed and being shown and being promoted on television. Now, this act, this abnormal act, is uh, society is trying to make it seem like it's something very normal. You know, there was always a division between some type of evil acts in society and religion. But now today you see some people in the name of religion. They come and they say, yes, I'm practicing. I'm a priest. And there are also some Muslims. I'm a Jew. I'm from this religion. I'm from that religion. And they come and they perform this type of behavior and, perform, and promote this type of behavior. And this is something that I was shocked to see yesterday. On some social networks, you see some Muslims. Some Muslims in order to show that they are open-minded in order to show that they are welcoming and they accept everyone. So what do they do? They come and they abandon their teachings and their belief and the Qur'an and the message of Rasulullah and logic. They abandon that and they come and they put that rainbow flag as their icon on their Twitter or Facebook or Instagram account. Now, it's understandable if you cannot say no and you cannot show your, voice your opinion against an act, that's understandable. You know, you don't, we don't want to get you in trouble and amr bil ma'roof and nahi al munkar. It's only, you can, it could, it's one of the conditions of amr bil ma'roof in joining the good and forbidding the evil is that if you're not going to be harmed in any way. Some people say, okay, we're going to be harmed. Okay, that's understandable. But letting go of your own identity and going and promoting something, if you feel that you really have a passion to promote something, go and promote the rights of Palestinians, promote the rights of the innocent people that are being killed all over the world. If you want to be an activist, there's so many things that you can be an activist about. You left all of them and you come and you want to choose that foul act. So we Muslims need to be extra vigilant and we need to be extra careful. And this is why we see the religion of Islam it has provided a solution. It has provided a solution that I want to go through it quickly and that is marriage. The right type of marriage, not the marriage that was defined yesterday by the Supreme Court. The marriage that's defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A marriage where Allah says, I have created two spouses from the opposite gender for one another because this is the only way that it will work. This is the only way that there will be reproduction. This is the, the only way that humanity and society could carry on. Other ways it will not carry on. Allah says in the Quran, وَأَنْكِحُوا الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ إِنْ يَكُونُوا فُقَرَاءَ يُغْنِهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Wallahu wasi'un alim. Marriage is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. It's the tradition of Rasulullah where he says, Az-zawaju sunnati, faman raghiba an sunnati, falaysa minni. Marriage is the sunnah of Rasulullah. This is why scholars say that if someone delays marriage, they're doing two things. One of two things. The first is that they are Delaying a recommended act, delaying something that is mustahab. 
Or if they are not delaying something that is recommended, they are, perf- they are doing something that's haram. Because marriage originally, in its original rule, it's recommended. But that rule of recommendation, it could turn into wajib. It could turn into an obligation. When does it turn into an obligation? It becomes obligatory when someone starts to disobey Allah in order to satisfy their desires in a haram way, in a, in a wrong way. So then marriage becomes obligatory. And this is why we see that the religion of Islam compared to all other religions, it sees marriage as a sanctuary. It sees marriage as a sacred institution, as a form of immunity, a form of protection. There were men during the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that used to fast 365 days out of the year. They chose not to get married. They decided to pray the whole night. As soon as the sun goes down, up until the sun rises, they are praying and they're fasting and they're doing all of these acts. So they sat with, with each other and then they said, you know what, we're praying more than Rasulullah. Sometimes we see Rasulullah, he's on a break. Or we're not married and Rasulullah, he goes and he spends time with his family. We're fasting every day while some days we see Rasulullah is eating. He's not fasting. So they concluded amongst themselves that they are a'bad. They have reached the level of obedience, a higher level than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So they came to Rasulullah and they told him, they told him we pray every day. We fast every day. We're praying the whole night. And we're not married because we are devoted only to Allah and we don't want any distraction. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi told them, I fast some days and I break my fast some days. Of course, not in the month of Ramadan, other, other days. I pray some hours of the night and I sleep some hours of the night. I get married and then he says, Az-zawaju sunnati. فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Because marriage is my sunnah and he who leaves that sunnah is not from me. And then Rasulullah tells them, I do all of this and I am closer to Allah than all of you. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to have a way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just send us a religion so that we are just praying 24 hours and devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah sent us a religion so that we can live a life, a productive life. Because when you are with your family, this is a form of ibadah. When you are getting married, this is a form of worship. When you are doing anything for this life, as long as it's not haram, it also counts as something that is good for you and something that is recommended for you. So marriage, it solves many of our problems. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with that desire, with that sexual desire, that physical desire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a solution for it. Just like there's a problem, there's also a solution. And that is the solution that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. Marriage It helps you socially. It helps a person socially in society. The hadith says, اسْتَكْثِرُوا مِنَ الْأَخِلَّاءِ فَإِنَّهُمْ يَنْفَعُونَكُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Try to have friends. Try to broaden your social circle. Because the more friends you have, this is going to benefit you in this life and in the afterlife. And this is what we see the religion of Islam is. The religion of Islam is a very social religion. You could pray by yourself in the room or you can go and pray in jama'ah, in congregation with everyone and your reward will be multiplied. You could eat by yourself or you could eat with a group of people. In the month of Ramadan, you could eat by yourself or invite others and inviting others is very rewarding. And we see that marriage, it solves that social problem. It solves the physical problem. Emotionally, Every single one of us, we need someone to speak to, someone to talk to, someone to socialize with, someone to feel a sense of belonging with, someone to trust, 
and tell our secrets to. That is the marriage. Allah, Allah says in the Quran, Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahun. When you're married, there's a form of trust with one another. It's as if you're, they're clothes. Clothes serve, serve as a form of protection. They serve as a form of beautification. They serve as a form of immunity from anything around you. And this is why when we look at the marriage of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, alayhum salam he says, لَقَدْ كُنْتُ أَنظُرْ إِلَيْهَا فَتَنْكَشُفُ عَنِّيَ الْهُمُومُ وَالْأَحْزَانِ he says, as soon as I would look at Fatima, as soon as I would look at the face of Fatima to Zahra, all of my sadness, all of my humum, all of my miseries and problems would go away. And today, we should also remember one of the wives of Rasulullah, the first wife of Rasulullah, where today is her death anniversary, and that is Khadija bint Khuwaylid. The wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The wife of Rasulullah that was the first to support Rasulullah. The first to help Rasulullah in times of need. It was her, that it was Khadija that believed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi when no one else believed in him. This is why we see that Rasulullah was loyal to Khadija many years after her death. Rasulullah, yes, he got married. Of course, while he was married to Khadija, he did not have any other wife. Then after her death, there were reasons, social, economic, political reasons that Rasulullah decided to get married. But then you see that he would always remember Khadija. Always he would remember her. Sometimes he would slaughter a sheep and then he would give the meat to the friends of Khadija. Some of the wives of Rasulullah, some of the other wives, they became very jealous. And it's funny, where one of them becomes jealous of a dead woman. Khadija was dead. She wasn't in her life. But they were still jealous from Khadija and from the children of Khadija, Fatima alayhi salam. She comes and she tells Rasulullah, why do you keep remembering that old woman when Allah gave you beautiful women, rich women, powerful women that are helping you right now? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Allah did not replace the position of Khadija in my heart. Khadija still has a position in my heart. Why? Because she believed in me when no one believed in me. And she gave me when no one gave me. This was Khadija alayhi salam. And this was one of the marriages of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that was an exemplary marriage. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he was in love with Khadija. He would constantly remember Khadija. And today is the anniversary of the, of the death of Khadija. So we... Remember Khadija, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, this forgotten wife of Rasulullah. Many people today, many Muslims, they remember the wives of Rasulullah and they neglect Khadija, that honorable woman, the favorite wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.